Women and Art, a Post-Feminist View. Tom Golden and Janice B. Mingo speak with author Alexander Adams. Men are good, as are you. Oh, men are good, as are you. And I'm here with Janice B. Mingo. I'm Tom Golden here with Janice B. Mingo, one of my favorite men's advocates. Just so insightful. You should read her Substack. Whatever you do, go and check out her Substack. But Janice and I are going to talk with Alexander Adams today. And Alexander Adams has written a really fascinating book called Women and Art, a Post-Feminist View. And there's so many things about this book that I want to tell you, but, you know, we're going to, well, I'll tell you as we go along. But in the meantime, um, let me show you something. Alexander's not just an art critic. He's not just an author. He's also an artist. This is one of his pieces of art here. The fascinating, uh, uh, beautiful piece of art, but it's got a sticker right there. <laughs> And apparently, Alexander was thinking, imagining a, a women's studies person with stickers just going up, sticking a feminist sticker onto a beautiful piece of work. There's one of my favorites, the man sitting, I think that one's called. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Reminds me of Magritte, who is my all-time favorite. And there's a beautiful uh, portrait of a photographer. So Alexander has a lot of talents a lot of different talents, and boy, this book shows it. I mean, the book to me was fascinating because the book literally parallels our work as men's advocates in looking at feminism and how it's impacted all kinds of things like domestic violence and suicide prevention and things like that. But his focus on art really comes up with some of the same conclusions that we do. And it is absolutely fascinating to, to see the book. I mean, it's just, uh, and you learn about art history, you learn about art, you learn about about female artists, which I knew almost nothing about. And I had, it took me a long time to read the book because every time he'd talk about a female artist and saying, this was really good, this was good, I'd go in, <laughs> online and, and get uh, completely um, detached looking at all these beautiful pieces of art and then come back, oh yeah, I got to finish this chapter. <laughs> so it's that kind of book. It's captivating. And... Um, Alexander, maybe you can start off by just telling us a little bit about yourself and maybe tell us a little bit about why you wanted to write this book. Well, thank you, Tom, and thank you, Janice. Um, yeah, uh, well, I should uh, tell you a little bit about my background. I studied art and art history, so it was fine art and art history uh, at some goldsmiths in London in the early 1990s. Huh. So half of my time was making art and half of it was... Um, discussing or analysing art, and so I've carried on doing that um, since uh, graduating. And I've had a lot of exhibitions and sold a lot of paintings and drawings and uh, been published in um, books and magazines and so forth. Um, and I've also written a lot, and, and that's how I, that's basically how I ended up doing what I'm doing now, because I went into writing reviews and I was, it was which is kind of interesting because what you're doing is you're getting uh, you're getting the, you're taking the temperature of the art world as it as it were because you're mm -hmm. getting books across your desk that are for review and these are new books you're also getting invited to exhibitions you're getting news about exhibitions and prizes and so this gives you a good cross section of what's actually happening in the art world and i was seeing this pattern again and again i was seeing a lot more women artists being promoted and exhibited and discussed and so forth but a lot of them weren't very good, and I was and I was wondering quite how they were getting to this position, and then I was also seeing some a weird narrative that um, women were um, systemically disadvantaged, and that this wasn't a historical problem. This was a problem that's happening now, and yet what I was seeing coming across my desk was kind of reflecting something different. I couldn't see a systemic problem because I was seeing lots of women artists being promoted, lots of female um, authors, lots of female academics, lots of um, women being appointed to different positions in the art world, sometimes very major positions. And I couldn't see this systemic uh, oppression that I was being told about that was apparently the driving factor between a lot of behind a lot of these press releases and these actions and so forth. So um, basically, I wanted to investigate what feminists were saying about fine art now and how they um, retrospectively viewed uh, the history of art and 
so and trying to measure that against the reality that I saw um, as an art critic and as a practicing artist. And mm. so the book um, Women and Art, um, a post-feminist view, uh, is what I came up with, which was uh, published um, earlier this year. Mm. Mm -hmm. and a fascinating book it is. Indeed. Yeah, well, maybe, uh, Alexander, we could start with your, your chapter on uh, the, I forget the exact title now, the history, um, the, history the history chapter yeah, on, yeah. on women, women artists. And, uh, and so you're really in that chapter, which alone, I think, you know, the, the research for that chapter, you know, it could be a whole book just, just on its own. It's, really? it's a extremely informative and fascinating, very engaging, yeah, yes. fascinating chapter. Yes. And so you're really, you're taking on the, I guess what the primary feminist narrative or one of the primary feminist narratives about women artists, which is that women were excluded from the domain of high art because of prejudice primarily because men didn't believe women could create art and therefore women were uh, actively excluded. And also if they did manage to somehow create art, they were erased then from the, the, the history of, of art. And your chapter doesn't entirely deny the exclusion narrative, but it certainly uh, complicates it. So I wonder if you could say a little bit about about what you found in your in your uh, research. Yeah, well, it, it did involve a lot of research, um, um, and I was fascinated because I, what I was discovering in the research was that um, women were largely excluded, but there were different reasons for this. So. One of this was the fact that you had guilds and guilds operated before uh, trade unions, and they, but they were essentially ways of um, acting to protect and promote uh, professionals in the organize in a particular field. So um, in the old days, in the sort of uh, Middle Ages and the Renaissance period, and even later, the, you couldn't practice um, as a professional painter, as a professional picture painter, unless you had qualified as, a, as an artist and you were a member of a guild and you paid um, your, your, um, your annual subscription, your, your fee. So actually, so the, there was not only a question of women not tending to be union um, uh, guild members, it was also a way of keeping out non-professional painters who were also men it was it was to stop it was to stop um people from outside the field moving in and taking away the the work that would be uh, the livelihood for guild members so it wasn't just women uh, although women were, were tended to be excluded actually what you find is when you dig into the records there are actually quite a fair number of women who were practicing artists but they weren't on guild roles because they were often a member of a family and though so they were painting and they were doing it sort of um without declaring their status because they didn't want to pay the the fees, the guild fees. So basically they were getting away with not being taxed. So that's why they weren't on the books. They were <laughs> painting and they were contributing and they were valued, but they just um, weren't doing it officially because um, they didn't want to pay tax. And that was also the case for children as well, not just, uh, not just the wives. Um, so you find that there was more activity going on in the art field historically involving women than you expect uh, and there also women were reaching quite high levels they were um, getting commissions they were also um, working quite well as portrait artists because often they couldn't do history painting because they couldn't get into academies so they couldn't study anatomy enough to do history painting and religious painting so they tended to go to portraiture and that could actually be a very lucrative field. So you find that there are lots of women portraitists, also lots of women who were pastel artists mm. because the pastel medium did not have a guild. So they couldn't be excluded because they weren't guild members because there was no mm. guild in that area. So that's huh. why you find a lot of women becoming pastel artists. Huh. Um, and so, so you have lots of women doing quite well, um, but they tend to fade uh, in a way that most artists most male artists also fade. 
so you find um, women with very high re reputations and women and feminists point to this and say, oh, look at this fantastic woman. She was really well regarded. She was quite famous. She became rich, but you've never heard of her. How That, that must be the evil patriarchy writing around of history. Well, the evil right. patriarchy was busy writing out the, the history of male artists at the time as well. So, um, yeah, that doesn't really compute. But um, yeah, so you can find all sorts of these um, examples uh, scattered throughout history. And that was one of the fascinating things to me was that, you know, they've only taken a, a small part of the art history and blown it into oppression when you see, you, sh you show over and over again that the same thing happened to men, you know, <laughs> in, in so many different ways. It's just fascinating. You know, so you can't, you could also make a case that men were oppressed, you know. Yeah, so, uh, well, certainly men men who weren't guild members were, so were definitely oppressed. Right, right. Um, and, yeah, and I remember who was it was um, was a hired artist to Queen such and such in what year? I mean, it was like it was like a long, long time ago. They had this female artist who was commissioned by the Queen, you know, to do art, and it's like, okay, you know, she wasn't. Yeah, it goes back oppressed. to the seventeenth, the seventeenth century, sixteenth century. Yes, yes, you have you have um, female artists being commissioned by yes. patrons, both male and female. Uh, royal patrons. Uh, some of them went on to become court painters. Huh. That's one of the things I loved about your book was it's very fair and reasoned and it doesn't pull punches. I mean, if if women were discriminated against in some way, you said, this is what happened. But you also say, but wait a minute, you know, this doesn't add up because this, this, and this. So it wasn't like a, an ideological book. It's really more like a history book that's telling the truth yeah. about what happened. Well, and I really I think appreciated what, what, that. Yeah, because what, what amazed me was, of course, there are undeniable cases where women were um, excluded on the basis of their sex. Yes. So, for example, you had a lot of academies. They weren't accepting women artists or women students up until about sort of 1890 or so. But if you go to the appendix of this book, you'll find that in sort of, uh, I think it's 1607, the first academy in Europe opened its doors to women artists. So 1607, that's basically when um, art academies were established. You get this this women starting to enter art academies. So although art academies were a barrier to women artists, um, because you were expected to go through this academic training before you were considered sort of uh, sufficiently qualified enough to become a guild member or yeah. whatever, um, there was um, there were also academies that were open to women. Um, so it's so it's true that uh, they were being excluded in one respect by them, but in the other respect, if you went to the right place, if you had enough skill, and a lot of um, female artists who were really really skilled and had a bit of money, to be fair, were able to travel to Italy, to the various cities in Italy which had um, academies which were open to women. Huh. Um, so it was possible. Interesting. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I found that really useful that. You, you do look at the ways in which women faced special challenges as artists, but you also clarify that the, the, they, they weren't necessarily being excluded because the patriarchy wanted to exclude women. It was, there, were, there were specific reasons why they were excluded. At one point, I think you talk about um, the discomfort that um, was often felt when, uh, if you had nude, um, you know, nude art classes, it, it wasn't considered correct or, or appropriate for women to train in that way with men. And so that was another way that women were excluded. It wasn't because women were hated or thought to be, um, you know, to, to lack any kind of talent. It had to do with uh, notions of propriety. Um, and, and so that was another challenge that a woman would face if, if that was her you know, right. chosen uh, field of endeavor. So, yeah, I really, I, I appreciated that and found it fascinating. And, and, um, and you say that by pretty much the end of the 19th century, although there might have been some lingering prejudice, that the, the major barriers preventing women from doing high art had fallen. Is that correct? Yeah, so what you find is that the academies open up in around sort of 1880 to 1900. Um, by 
certain um, certainly by the First World War, at the end of the First World War in 1918, all of the significant institutional barriers had gone. Um, I mean, there was still social, there was still sort of social prejudice and so forth, but not as much as you'd think. If you look back at the history of, of various artists, female artists, you'll find that when they're discussed, um, if they have overcome the obstacles that were in their way, um, which were sometimes more than male counterparts faced, in some cases they were the same or no, di you know, no different, um, they were actually quite well accepted, they were quite well paid, they were, they were treated well by their male colleagues and so forth. Um, it wasn't it wasn't the fact that they were they were forever sort of marked by their sex. Once they had proved that they had quality, they won prizes, they became sort of senior members of uh, academies and so forth. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so yeah, so what, what you find is that by the I, I've talked about this as the golden age of societies from about sort of 18, about 1880, 1900 up to like about 19, uh, sort of early 1960s or so, you had this golden age of societies where women were able to enter academies, they were able to set up their own societies, they were enter, allowed to enter open exhibitions, they were winning prizes and medals, um, and they had a huge amount of freedom and they were treated quite well by male colleagues in general. Um, and so this was, a, this was the perfect time when they could flourish, where if you were good enough you could win prizes. You could make money. You could become, you could become a professional artist and live from your art if you were good enough. And I know I've discussed a couple of these artists in the book. Yes. Uh, so, for example, um, uh, Tamara Delempica is a great. She became famous because she entered some exhibitions in Paris uh, in the uh, late 1920s and became very successful. Um, and she became a, a media darling. She was sort of starred in sort of journals and newspapers in the 1930s and 40s. Hmm. And she was, uh, people were coming in to take photo shoots of her in her sort of carefully crafted um, apartment. And um, she, was a, she, was a, she was a sort of a superstar. So hmm. you had that freedom. But then in the 1960s came feminism. And suddenly there was a contraction of what you were able to do. You weren't able to say, I'm just, in, I'm just a woman artist who, who just wants to be known for her art. I'm not political. I'm not working on gender issues and so forth because at that point if you're not part of the movement you're a part of the problem comrade starts to be <laughs> right. so a lot yeah. of, a lot of really talented women artists are are forced to start being political in their art and that diminishes them and also a lot of artists who have no talent at all become quite prominent because they're doing um political feminist work so that's why i say that there is this golden period but it it ends in the 1960s sadly huh. mm -hmm. yeah i thought that was fascinating yes. that, that you know that you make the argument that actually women's uh opportunities for free self-expression as artists and to to uh, create their own kind of art really begin to narrow once the feminist narrative takes hold and once there is that kind of totalitarian insistence that every woman has to join the movement uh, as you say um, because there is no personal anymore if you if you accept the feminist narrative everything is political and therefore you have to be involved in the movement you have to express your solidarity you have to be trying to strike a blow against uh, patriarchal oppression and you have to um, take on certain subjects that are considered appropriate feminist subjects rather than simply doing art in the way that it, it's it's, it's the end of choice feminism to. the beginning mm -hmm. of the women's liberation movement in the 1960s is mm. the end of choice feminism where it's not a question of a woman simply striving to have the equal opportunities of a man there must be actual concessions and there's actually a political dimension which is inescapable and of course that's linked to um the nexus of uh, feminism and um marxism mm. in the 1960s mm. yeah mm -hmm. interesting mm -hmm. so some of it they, they actually the feminists tried to coordinate uh the content they had also right i mean so that it wasn't uh, about mommies and babies it was <laughs> it was about the you know we are a woman we're strong. Yes, you you find you find this very interesting backlash about. Um, I think we're going to talk about. You wanted to talk about Mary Cassatt, and it's a very interesting case because she's an artist who um, worked in the in. She's an American artist, came from Philadelphia, went to study in Paris in the 
1870s, and she was there in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, and then she came back to uh, the USA. Um, she never married, uh, and she was quite well known for her paintings of mothers and infants. Um, hmm. And there's wow. a sort of an uneasy relationship with feminist uh, art historians. Yes. Is this being a little bit too cosy? Is she sort of, is she sanctifying the domestic? Is she actually sort right. of... Um, uh, sort of e extending the patriarchy's hold by you know taking right. out these domestic right. subjects and so right. forth. I mean, she was she was choosing the stuff that was close to her and stuff that obviously meant a great deal to her because you know sometimes these were um, relatives uh, who had children. And um, yeah, so what what happened was that um, um, uh, there's this interesting case. So we had um, there's a, a little chapter on this uh, in the book about. Um, a little section on uh, Mary Cassatt, because there, there was a feminist art historian um, called uh, Griselda Pollock, and she said that um, Mary Cassatt is, is someone who's been written out of history. Um, so she wrote a book and she said, you know, like the sort of, um, 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 yeah, so, so basically um, Mary Cassatt had been written out of history, she had been neglected. And I thought, well, that's not true. I've seen lots of books on Mary Cassatt. Well, what, what are you talking about? I've seen why she's part of the Impressionist movement. The Impressionist movement is very well studied, very well regarded, highly popular. Lots of books, lots of exhibitions on the Impressionists. I haven't seen a dearth of work on um, Mary Cassatt. So I went through the figures and I actually I, I looked at the figures and I saw that some... Um, um, I went to an academic, uh, to JSTOR, which is an academic uh, website, um, and I looked at the number of hits on um, Mary Cassatt. So I looked at Cassatt, and there were 2,000 for Cassatt, and there were 500 for Signac, and Cayabot got um, 246 and so forth. Um, but then, okay, well, they're lesser known artists. What about uh, Camille Passaro? So Camille Passaro is one of the founding fathers of Impressionism, great painter, very famous you couldn't discuss Impressionism without him. So I looked at the figures about how many how many hits there were for um, Pizarro. So Pizarro gets 1,200 hits. Cassatt gets over 2,000. So, <laughs> so where yeah. is this oppression? This is fantastic. She's yeah. getting huge amounts of coverage. Okay, maybe not quite as much as, as Monet, but she's, you know, she, she's, she's doing better than one of the founding fathers of Impressionism. I can't see any. I can't see any neglect at all. So when I actually mm -hmm. looked back through the academic literature, I was seeing this that these grand statements by feminists were just not actually being borne out by the facts. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. that's a little bit of a problem. But uh, yeah, that tends to be the way feminist criticism, no matter what the area, um, what the subject area is. What uh, they do. They, yeah, they, they just keep making these statements over and over again about neglect or erasure or um you know lack of appreciation or they claim that patriarchal critics are trying to fit the artist into a certain box but in fact often they're the ones that are trying to fit the artist into a certain box and yep. it, it's so ironic in that the the level of harsh judgment exercised by these feminist critics and as you say the the unease with certain types of subject matter or certain types of styles, right. which are right. seen as complicit with patriarchy yes. or, you know, too, too safely feminine. Uh, they, 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 you know, uh, always prioritize what is seen as, as uh, subversive or rebellious kind of subjects and styles. And so they create all of these hierarchies um while claiming that they're against hierarchy and claiming that they're <laughs> seeking to free women from patriarchal constraints but they are imposing all sorts of constraints right. of their own and i thought you did a fantastic job of showing in all, all the different ways that that happens as a result of, of yes. feminist ideology yes yeah and i i, I think that um you're you're also interested in the idea about um, hierarchy and the canon, um, so yes. that, that that kind of relates to what you've just said. So the situation is that feminists have have got a problem with the canon. So the canon is essentially um, it's a story that we tell ourselves about what the great works of our art are. So this could be literature, could be music, could be fine art, 
and you think about these great works of art and you think about them in quite a simplified way and you think, think about them sequentially and you think about them in terms of important artists and um, stylistic periods. And so this is a way of remembering how this, the evolution of art has happened, the different stages, the key figures, the key works. Um, these are the things that you should know in able in un, to understand how art has developed and also to understand uh, culture, the development of culture more generally. So, the, oh, of course, feminists have a problem with this because there are basically no women in the in the canon, because um, because of the limitations on education, women didn't become, in general, stone carvers or painters of historical paintings uh, or um, painters of um, biblical scenes. They didn't usually do grand religious commissions. So there's no female uh, Sistine Chapel, for example. So because they didn't get these large prestigious commissions, they were seen less, they were regarded less, they tended to work in pastel, as I've said, in portraiture. Mm -hmm. So these are lesser regarded subjects. So these are, these are just, they don't get written into the grand histories of art. The grand histories of art tend to concentrate on grand works of art. So yes. that's why there are so that's why there are no women in the canon uh, before the 20th century. And and nor could there be really because they, they they weren't doing anything particularly significant in the areas that are considered important for the canon now of course feminists come in in the sort of uh, middle of the 20th century and of course they've got a problem so they want to say women have been excluded but then they go back through the historical register and they're not getting the suppressed geniuses that they hoped for. They're getting mm -hmm. rather mediocre figures. They're getting minor figures. They're getting people working in disciplines such as pastel or printmaking or uh, decorative arts. And they're doing very well in these areas, but this isn't oil painting or stone carving. You know, this isn't Michelangelo. This isn't Leonardo. This isn't Raphael. There is no, there is no female Raphael. There is no female Michelangelo. They just aren't there. So what do, what do feminists do? Well, you have uh, someone called Linda Nochlin saying, well, the reason that there are uh, none of these great figures in the history of art is because they've been diverted into the minor arts. So therefore, they have excelled in decorating, in book decorating, illum illumination that were produced by uh, the nuns in nunneries and so forth. And that's why you don't see them. They've been diverted into the minor handicrafts. Therefore, we don't have any. But there is also a counter argument that says there should. And so what do you do? So do you either write them into the canon when they're not really good enough to be there? No. Or do you simply destroy the canon? Or, no. or, you, or the, the third alternative is you can you can create a canon with only women artists. But <laughs> no, no one's going to be looking at those except for gender studies. <laughs> So what what do you do? So or you, so if you want to so if you want to you can destroy the canon and of course this aligns very closely with the thinking of um, uh, Marxists such as Christine Delphi in the feminist movement where she says you know like sort of um, we have to concentrate on uh, the fact that uh, women's labour women have been uh, alienated from their labour because they are doing domestic work for their husbands. Uh, and their brothers and so forth, they are raising families, they are not being able to contribute to the artistic heritage. Um, so therefore, they've been, they've, they've been sort of, um, they've never been part of this movement. And, the, and what a lot of uh, feminists and neo-Marxists were saying is, the whole idea of a canon is oppressive. oppressive. It's a hierarchy. It's right. a hierarchy of so-called geniuses, when in fact, we know that the truth of um, hum humanity is a social history. It's to do with groups, it's to do with communities and joint action. Whereas the story of the genius is, of course, this lie of the liberal enlightenment genius separated from his society, achieving amazing things because he is born different. Whereas we know that actually this is just privilege. So they say, we have to scrap all canons. And that means, of course, basically de destroying art history as we know it right which is quite a drastic step yeah. mm -hmm. has that i wanted to ask you about that too ha like uh, because certainly like what you're describing has happened in english literature 
to a very large extent. And mm. I think it is fair to say that the English literary canon which was attacked in very similar terms to what you're describing in the 1980s, it I probably has really been dismantled now. So that if you take a, a BA degree in English literature, you are not taught the canon anymore. Uh, it's quite possible to get a B, BA in literature and not to have read Chaucer and Shakespeare and Milton and Pope and Swift and Wordsworth and you know so on, um, and in fact to have taken many many courses in which all you learn about is the social justice kind of triumvirate about different types of oppression based on gender and race and class and sexuality and empire and all of that kind of thing, and um, so I yeah I wondered has that happened in art history as well? Yes. Um, well, to a degree. Uh, I, I think it's not quite as happened as much as that, but you do find that the sort of the, the sort of the uh, new criticism, which is essentially a sort of development of uh, neo-Marxist thinking from the 1930s, which rose up in the 1960s, has kind of it cemented itself as one of the two strands. So you've got the traditional art history strand, which um, mm. uh, is, as of course, incorporated some aspects of social history and so forth, and it's slightly more wide ranging. But then there is also this uh, new criticism, which um, seeks to sort of under underpin the sort of power dynamics and so forth. And it has taken over. And um, But I think the interesting thing about the canon is um, as I observe in the book, is that it can't be imposed from the top. You can try to impose it, you can right. write your own canon, but the canon is aggregative, and it is cumulative, and it is changeable, and it is not gatekept, because it comes from many sources. It is many art historians, it is many artists, it is many connoisseurs, it is um, people who have a profound interest in this. They make their own lists, they have their own favourites. They talk about them, they see these things, they buy these books, they buy these pictures, and that forms the overall um, sort of compost aggregate of the mm. canon. And it's never imposed from the top. It can't, you can't simply say, right. um, uh, we are excluding this group, because if enough people want to see them, that person or that group in the canon, they enter the canon. You can't stop them. You, there's no way of stopping them. You, you might exclude them from your canon or the official canon, but this is what people would be looking at. People will be talking about this. Mm. Will what this is will influence people, and so I think a lot of authoritarians, including feminists, and of course, you know, in various sort of dictatorships and sort of the Soviet Union, for example, they were busy. Re, they're busy rewriting the canon, telling us what's important. Um, but it, but in but it's always changing. It's always absorbing new people, and it's always discarding um, uh, proposals. Uh, and some of these proposals would be political proposals of people who are sort of politically significant or important to a movement, but then they get, they get forgotten. Uh, so the canon is um, is kind of it's uh, it's disaggregated and it's sort of spread out. It's sort of like um, it's sort of it's in the cloud, as it were. You you can't control it. Yeah, it's mm. organic in, that, in some ways. Yeah, that that's actually really interesting. I think that in a way that it, it's a it's a cheerier picture for uh, the survival of great art than for the survival of great literature. In a way, I mean, I think there are there is some great literature that also survives. Uh, that's part of that the kind of canon that you've described. For instance, Shakespeare. No matter what people say about. You know, Shakespeare is no better than any, any other playwright. Uh, it, it, it was simply, you know, he was selected because he fulfilled some sort of white supremacist Christian narrative or whatever. But it, it doesn't matter because people just continue to love Shakespeare. And so in that way, he will continue to survive. But then there are other writers like Milton, for instance, who's truly great and, and others, uh, 18th and 19th century great writers who I think do actually have to be taught in a way and they can be lost. They will be recovered eventually, but um, their um, canonicity is more limited, I think. Whereas I think great art perhaps has, mm. you, you, sim you simply see it and you see that you know, Caravaggio is 
is fantastic. And, and you yeah. don't even have to be uh, educated in art, I don't think, to be able to see I, that there is something also, there. Also, I think, I think the sort of, you, in terms of sheer accessibility, people go to museums yes. and they see, and they walk through it and they see all sorts of art. You yes. have to actually make an active effort to pick up a volume of Milton or Dryden. Exactly. And it takes yeah. a hell of a lot of commitment effort. to read. Yep. Dante, mm -hmm. for example. Yep. Um, yes, exactly. I yeah. mean, some some authors are easier than others, of course. But you know, you've got to pick up pick up a book, and you've got to read um, eighty, hundred pages of verse. Yeah, that's that's a serious that's a serious thing that you've got to do. Whereas, if you go to a museum, you can simply walk through past pictures, and you stop at what catches your eye. Yes, mm -hmm. you know, yes. and so that's yeah. so that's a lot easier. It, the, the the barrier for entry is a lot is a lot lower. So therefore, it's a very much harder to gate creep, gatekeep, or suppress or exclude, um, huh. uh, because you know p yeah. people are not yet taking Caravaggio off the walls, um, whereas they might be taking Milton off the syllabus. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they will, they are in to some extent wanting to, to uh, limit the, the, the viewership for, for Caravaggio or for Michelangelo, but um, it, it, it would, it would have to be such a totalitarian move to, to really, um, you know, put, put that art beyond the reach of the ordinary person. It would really be difficult to do. So, so yeah, that's very interesting. But then you talked in your, in your book about the difficulty that, that this denial of the canon or the attack on the canon creates for feminist critics, because then what kind of narrative can they themselves construct if they're not recognizing the individual artist as worth paying attention to you you end up always creating some kind of a canon uh, some sort of narrative of what matters and what people should be uh, thinking about and and looking at um, and I guess mainly it, it becomes then uh, a kind of feminist narrative about the oppressed woman rising up against her oppression, but still being victimized, yet somehow very courageous and heroic. And you talked about a few examples of, of women artists who have been fitted within that narrative. But there's always some sort of canon making going on, as you point out, even though canons are being denied and, and criticized. So that's, that's an interesting contradiction. Yeah. yeah, you have you have authors like uh, Whitney Chadwick, who says uh, who's a famous um, feminist art historian. Uh, she's published a book on women artists, uh, hmm. which is uh, very influential. And she says, um, uh, any study of women artists must examine how art history is written and the assumptions that underlie these hi its hierarchies. The stories of historical women artists elucidate the way history's emphasis on individual genius has distorted our understanding of workshop procedures and the nature of collaborative artistic production. And you see that this is actually something that comes up in feminist art collectives. So when I was studying the sort of the, the 1960s and 1970s, I was looking at all the different groups of um, and different publications and they're listed in this book and it's quite a it's quite a long list of different feminist organizations and a lot of them you notice that they're very centered on collective action on communities um this was obviously the time of the sort of the hippie communes of the late 60s and so forth uh, and this is very much a, a parallel thing um so it was like lots of artists communes in the 1970s, early 1970s, uh, very much along the lines of women's refuges. So there's, you find that there's a sort of a correlation between these these different strands, and um, obviously driven by the Marxist ethos of um, collective action, and also the idea that women think differently from men. They don't think in terms of individual genius. They are much more gentle and social and collaborative <laughs> I don't know how many women that, that applies to, but that's the story. That they are they are, they are gentle. They are gentle, communal, passive creatures mm -hmm. who, who do not struggle against each other. They work best mm -hmm. in collaboration. And these <laughs> humans, however short lived, yes. were attempts to prove that in reality. <laughs> I think I know they do why tend they to don't. Be short lived. <laughs> I think I know why they don't like geniuses. It's because there's more male geniuses than there are females by about. 
the higher you go in IQ, the less women are there, you know, the more men are there. And so you've got a lot yes, of men it's, who are... It's the, it's the exceptional head and the exceptional tail that, that there are more men who are extremely intelligent and geniuses, but there are also more men who are exceptionally at, stupid. At the lower end, yes, exactly right. But this gives them a good reason not to like geniuses, <laughs> you know, because there's not that many women who are. There are some, uh, but it's... Yeah, and, and, and also, you know, if, if you've been reading history books that are read by men, that have been written by men and are aimed at men and they lord male heroes of course you know as a feminist you're going to say well this is all bunk and i've got we've got to sweep away the whole thing so. yeah. Mm, yeah. crazy stuff you know one of the things about your book that i just loved was the chapter where you did the chart on uh on what you'd found maybe we could look at that chart a little bit is that would that be okay mm, that is fascinating yeah let's see if i can find it let's see and there it is yeah. So Can you tell so us about happened, how you did that and, and what brought you to it and, and what okay, you found? Well, this, this, was, this was kind of fun, but it was also turned out to be the most depressing year of my life. <laughs> oh, God. I'll explain why in a minute. <laughs> so what happened was I was, as I said, I was writing all these reviews and I was he hearing about the systemic oppression of women in the arts. And I was saying, well, this doesn't seem to match with what I'm getting across my desk. What I'm going to do right. is I'm going to start taking a record of what comes in. So if we have a, a book or an exhibition or an appointment to a job in a sort of biennale or arts organization or museum, I'm going to mark if it's male or female, or if it's a group project, I'm going to mark if it's mixed or if it's single sex, and if it's single sex, whether it's male or female. And so I will actually keep a record, and I'll keep a record, keep a tally um, for all of the press releases that reached me. I'd also check publishers' catalogues. I'd also, you know, go to a few uh, museum websites and so forth. And I wasn't actively sorting. I was just basically doing my job as a journalist and uh, sort of passively receiving what was sent to me um, and saying, OK, well, this is obviously representative of the very highest level. But that's kind of interesting because when you look at the figures, you find that um, women, um, yeah, so women were making, uh, were getting 63% of the appointments. They were getting 69% of the awards and prizes. And this is kind of interesting because they only make up around 45% of the active artists in mm. the arts. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I guess so much for equality. Just... You, you collected that data over a year too. I mean, what yeah, we don't so see on the chart is that this is months and months of data that you collected. Yeah, it was it was collated over a year, so you, people can go through it. And and obviously, you've got prob you, you think okay, well, there's probably seasonal fluctuations and right. so forth. And right. obviously, sort of nope. you know, Nash International Women's Day, so sort of March is in incredibly. Is, is off the charts with women events, single uh, sex. Oh, well, I also noticed how many single sex events there were for women right. compared to right. men. Many, many more. Right. Um, right. And it's not as if they, they're being neglected in the general flow of mixed exhibitions or solo exhibitions. They're getting, they're getting loads of those now. Yeah. Um, so I was going through these and, um, and I, and so I was sort of crunching the data and obviously this is sort of focused on Western art. Um, these are mainly sort of English speaking or maybe some sort of French or German speaking press releases and museums and so forth. So it's, it's not entirely um, representative and I, I don't claim that, but I said, you know, it's interesting that at the very top level in the West, I can't see any of this systemic oppression right at the top. And it was um, turned out to be the most depressing year of my life because it hypersensitized me. It turned me into uh, someone who was basically thinking like a feminist. Because I've, every time I opened up a press release, I was scanning it for a, a gendered name or for a pronoun. So I could, right. and, and I stopped looking at the art and I stopped looking at the words huh. and I stopped looking, thinking about the ideas. I was just simply looking to see male or female and marking huh. it down on my chart. And because mm -hmm. and and, that was my job, because I, I was searching right, for the data right, for this information. Right. Um, but of course, it conditioned me to see things in only in um, binary terms of sex. And um, it was extremely depressing because it, 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 it sort of it completely desensitizes you to art. And you think, oh, well, maybe this is how feminists or maybe, you know, some male men's right activists as well think 
that they're seeing things in this terms. Yes. And it's absolutely, it's, it's dehumanizing, it's desensitizing, it's, it's very uncivilized, it's uncultured, and it turns you into a hypersensitized monomaniac. Um, so right. I was, and yeah. I had I, I had intended to continue this taking this data and seeing if if the trends went up or down over the years. And I just I felt I, after a year I couldn't cope with it anymore. Good just for you. Stop. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't seem like it's going to change anytime soon, but uh, maybe it will. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's such a dreary, as you say, and totalitarian. And you make that case in your book really well too that the clear parallels between Nazism or National Socialism on the one hand and communism on the other hand, and then feminism itself with their collectivism, their denial of the individual, their denial of individual freedom, their denial that there is anything that can be considered personal. Yes. Um, you know, all of that, uh, they are so similar. And as you say, so life denying and yes. just so, so, so grim in their collectivism and, and their, their in, lack of interest in, in the individual. They're, they're only interested in people yeah. as, as it's, they it's, fit it's, into their, these categories. Yeah. It's, it's brutalizing and it's underpinned. You'll find that all sort of great art, uh, great religious movements and political movements are underpinned by a narrative and it's often a, the narrative of oppression. So with, uh, with uh, Nazism, it's, um, oh, the Jewish financiers are, are doing down the German people. With uh, the Soviets, it's with the, the capitalist class and the Tsar is doing down the people. Um, with feminism, it's, oh, the patriarchy is doing down women and so forth. And I discussed the idea of the disadvantage narrative, which is basically the one that underpins uh, feminism. And, and that says, basically, look at the historical injustice that women have faced. It's terrible and it's still continuing. Now, right. what? Now, however true that may have been in the past, when we talked about like women not having opportunities to study at academies or being able to enter open exhibitions and so forth, that has not been the case for at least from 1900 in terms of institutions. And in social terms, since the 1950s or so, women have been leading art movements. They've been making huge amounts of money. They've, they've been treated very well. So the narrative which may have been true originally is no longer true but there is no recognition of the progress that's been made you yeah. find this also in in sort of uh, race issues with um the anti-racism movement that they will say that there's been no there's been no um advance since the civil rights movement in fact things are things are worse now than they've ever been <laughs> before they, right. absolutely, they, ha they have to deny any sense of progress or any sense of um, mm -hmm. equality or even a reversal where women now are right. advantaged. If I was right. starting out as an artist um, and all things being equal, I could choose my sex. Then if I wanted to become a famous artist, I would be a woman. I would choose a woman because I could yeah. get much more advantages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would, yeah. I, would be, I would be playing on that. I'd be taking the grants. I'd be taking the prizes, which are limited to women only. Yeah. I'd be... Um, uh, publishing my art in um, websites and magazines dedicated to women only, I'd be, I'd be pushing that. Yep. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, yeah. the disadvantaged narrative is one that's potentially true, but that's kind of irrelevant, but it is now definitely untrue. But women cannot, but fa sorry, feminists and the women's art lobby, which is not synonymous, do not admit that the situation has fundamentally changed. And if you look at this data, you will see that the situation has fundamentally changed. Right. That women are very much advantaged by the public arts. And what would happen if they did admit that things had changed? Um, the, a, lo a lot of their funding and their political cause and the sympathy that they get in the pub by a sort of uh, the public generally accepting without questioning and without examining the facts, it would disappear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. they're doing it for the money. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, well, and the power it, and the yep. rush of righteous outrage yep. and you know, the another thing that I remember of was innocent the, victimhood. The chapter in the book on the Soviet Union and the women artists there, and it just reminded me of the feminists. 
you know, because the Soviet, they try to control the type of art that's done. You know, it's the kind of the mm-hmm. same way the feminists do with women's art in today's world. I mean, it's just fascinating, the connections between the two. And, and also you find that I, I discussed that um, there was this uh, phrase, I think it's Natalia um, Goncharova. She used the word uh, chevolek, which is a gender neutral term for person. Uh, because mm-hmm. you'll find it in most languages, though huh. um, English is, is slightly different, but in most languages, a noun has to be gendered. Right. So we can say artist, and that's neutral. But in most languages, you have to you have to um, add a gender. Um, and so she she ostentatiously chose um, a word that would um, strip her of gender because this would um, this would sort of show that she was a new person in the way that the Soviets wanted to, to build the new right. Soviet man, the right. new man. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Crazy, crazy. Yes. You know, throughout the book, yeah. I was impressed with your capacity to kind of see what the feminists are doing and the way they're doing it. And one of the things that got me uh, was this quote here, which literally is talking about feminists and how they turn this whole thing into this bitter, anger, resentful crap. And then you compare it to the Stoics. And the Stoics, in my mind, reminds me of men and the way men deal with emotions, the way men deal with social situations, with emotional stuff. And, you know, trying to make it so that, you know, things are right without, um, you know, causing all kinds of trouble. But the feminist side is the complete opposite. You know, I think you did a nice job in in mm-hmm. looking at that and then concluding, you know, that's just... Uh, it just shows me how deeply you understand the feminist side of things. And it's fascinating to me as someone who has just been involved with the art world, really, is able to see that clearly. So kudos to you. Well, well th- thank you. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a political specialist. Um, I did know a, a little bit about feminism before I started research on the book, but um, right. I read a lot more and I read some of the primary literature. So, I, you know, I, obviously I had to get a, a sense of, of what they were actually saying. And I didn't want to misrepresent what they were saying. Yes. Um, I, I, dis- I disagree with a lot of it. Uh, some, some of it is true. Some of it is true, but also kind of irrelevant. But, you know, I wanted to be able to say, well, I have read Gloria Steinem and, and Christine Delphi and, um, um, and, uh, and also because, because, you know, if, if this book has to have any value, it has to be, uh, at least grounded in fact and uh, grounded and it is. in their own statements. Yeah. It is. Mm-hmm. It's well yeah. grounded, in fact, I think. Yeah, yeah, I thought you did an excellent job. Your chapter on the development of feminist art criticism is really interesting and yes. really well done. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I guess the last question I had for you, Alexander, was um, I, I was trying to imagine, you know, how um, art how art criticism, the art world, um, the development of of female artists, how all of that might have looked if feminism hadn't come along. Uh, It's uh, almost impossible to imagine uh, the 20th century without feminism. But let's imagine that, um, you know, a lot of people read your book and take it very seriously and recognize the um, falsehoods and the limitations that are involved in the imposition of this narrative onto the development of art and artist production. What, what would be your ideal of art criticism? you know, with, without the, the, the gendered narrative that seems to be everywhere now? What would, it, what would art criticism be like? Well, I think it would be, it would be maybe that an extension of the golden age of societies where mm-hmm. um, women artists had the opportunity to train and the opportunity to exhibit and so forth, but they weren't, um, but it was sort of a flowering of, of choice feminism where if you were good enough, you could reach whatever level um, your your ability warranted, and also your achievements, because there's a difference between achievements and ability. Yes. And there are lots of very able people who don't follow up with original achievements. There are lots of people who have 
who achieve things kind of against the handicap of like having a sort of a, a limited technique or a limited understanding of art. They can they they transcend that, and in some respects, that ignorance sometimes sort of lifts them up. That they can do things that other people would educated people would say, well, that's not possible. You can't do that. Um, how things might have turned out. Um, I think that we would have a lot. I, I think we'd have a lot more good art. We'd also have less um, public art that's sponsored purely for political reasons to support the women's art lobby, uh, which is different from feminism. But this is simply, you know, the the quota system. Um, and when I started out talking about the quota system about sort of five years ago in various sort of low circulation art magazines and so forth, I got a lot of pushback. It was like, no, 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 no. This is just this is just um, women taking their place at the table, and you're just you're just you're just mm. angry with the way things are. You, you're just a dinosaur. You just don't want to see. Um, you, yeah, absolutely. You, you don't you don't want to, you don't want to see minorities taking their place at the table. You know, um, um, and I was saying no, no, no. If you look at the quality of the work, this work is being promoted on an unofficial quota. You remove that quota, and you're going to you're going to get a you're going to get better art. You're going to get less political art. You're going to get more people. Um, uh, you're going to get more variety of subjects. You're going to allow artists more freedom to choose. They can opt out of politics if they want. Or they could do political work. I mean, I'm not saying that no one should do political art, and I'm not saying that no one should um, express an in-group preference. You know, if you're a black artist and you just want to speak to black people, then by all means do this. Make your make your black art for black people. Um, but I would say that I think that the art that would have been produced without the, the political constraints and also the artificial quotas would be much better. And recently, in a couple of years, in the last year or so, I've seen all of the arguments against the quotas, my quota points, disappearing, because it's obvious that there are quotas. You go to public hmm. arts organisations and they say there are quotas. They have quotas. They, huh. they, they'll, they'll, they'll admit this now. And they'll say that, yeah. yes, your funding... But they'll say they're necessary. <laughs> but it's necessary and it's good for society. Yes. It's, it's not good for... They don't. They don't talk about beauty. They don't talk about transcendence. They don't talk about exceptional art. They don't talk about genius. They will never talk about those things. They will only no. talk about things in social terms. They will only talk about things in terms of statistics huh. and yeah. community relations and so forth. They're because it's a very utilitarian, instrumentalist view of the art. They're not interested in the soul and in the passion and in the transcendental, transcendental qualities of art. Um, because they are mechanistic, they are materialistic. Um, so, yeah, so a, a little less of that thinking and a little more uh, good art would be most welcome. And let, let's hope that some, at least a few people read the book and they, they feel that this is a, um, a, an aspiration that's worth striving for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very Indeed. good. That's a good place to stop, too. Are we finished? Are there things you'd like to say, Alexander, that you haven't gotten a chance to say? Um, no, except that uh, thank, thank you very much for having me on. Um, people can follow as artist. Um, uh, I also have a Substack, so as well what as do you? buying I did not the book. Know that. Yeah, so as, as well as buying um, buying the book and buying other books which are available. Uh, online and through bookshops. Um, so there's a number of books. So there's Women and Art. There's Artivism, which is about uh, the politics in the museum world, which is a new book just over huh. my shoulder. Huh. And there's also Iconoclasm, which looks at the uh, the violence of uh, 2020 and the destruction of statues and what's the uh -huh. what are the origins of those huh. and how that's changed over time. Huh. So you can buy those books or you can um, go to Alexander Adams Art at Substack, and um, you can read my articles there for free. There are some paid ones. If you really want to support my work, then uh, you can subscribe, and that would be most welcome. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, I was going to mention the Alexander Art, Alexander Adams Art site. You can see yes, all that's, the things. Yes, that's, 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 that's where you can see my art. And so is that a part of the Substack? That's, that's completely true. Uh, that's separate from the Substack. So yeah, the yeah. Substack is my writing, and the Alexander Adams dot art is where you can just yes. go and uh, see the art that I've made. And we'll have links to all of this below. So look in the description, you'll find links to all of his good work. And uh, 
It's been good having you. It's been fascinating. I really enjoyed the book. It's it's almost like I'm grieving not being able to read more of it. You know, it's gone. <laughs> well, I have to. I'll have just I'll just have to write a follow up. There you go. <laughs> write a follow up. That's a good thing. So, Janice, anything else? No, thank you very much, Alexander. Really enjoyed the book and, and wonderful to speak and, to you. And enjoyed the talk today. It's been a good one. Mm -hmm. And Thanks. let's keep in mind that men are good. <laughs> we'll see you <laughs> <a minute. laughs> I filled in the blank. Men are good. Men are good, as are you.